And now, a word from our sponsors. Are you self-conscious about the things you wear? Do you feel you don't stand out enough? Do you wish you had merchandise that repped your favorite theater company? Well, push those fears aside when you purchase items from the Blank Conversation store. Now you could show off clothing that represents a brand that is so blank, you'll feel stylish wherever you go. By going to www.blankconversations.org slash store, you can purchase your very own t-shirt, beanie, hat, or even sew on patches, starting as low as $7. Order today, and we'll throw in some free stickers. Blank Conversations Store. We make the stuff so you can wear it. That's just how society works. Thank you, and enjoy the show. Blank Conversations Theater Company presents The Tragedy of Macbeth by William Shakespeare Edited by J.P. Crabb And directed by Jose Luis Solorzano Greetings, fair listeners, to The Tragedy of Macbeth, a play of ambition, corruption, and power, where kingship is brought upon by death, and witches' prophecies can turn men's minds sour. While this classic text tales of a Scottish king, we will bring the setting to our modern day. Transplanting these lessons you find will ring, even truer today with the Scottish play. A senator, now king, is Duncan, a noble man with a long political career has become the victor in a war of man. With trust in his colleagues, he has no fear. The battle has nearly ended, with nothing to confuse. Let us watch now as the witches come to share with us their news. When shall we three meet again, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There, to meet with Macbeth. Fair, fair is foul, and foul, and foul is, is fair. fair. Hover through the Hover fog through and the, the fog fog filthy, filthy air. air. We move on from prophecies and projections to the headquarters of Sir Duncan. What bloody man is that? He can report, as seemeth by his plight of the revolt. Hell, brave friend, say to the king the knowledge of the broil, it's thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood. The merciless MacDonald, the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of kerns and gallo glasses is supplied. And fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished steel carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. But... I am faint. My gashes cry for help. Go get him, surgeons. God save the king. Whence camest thou, worthy thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners flout the sky, Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict. Till that Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point rebellious, and, to conclude, the victory fell on Great earth. happiness! No more that thane of Cador shall deceive our bosom interest. 
go pronounce his present death, and, with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. As Duncan and his strategists celebrate their victory, the witches arrive for a fated meeting. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Look what I have. Show me, show me! Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. The drum, the drum! Macbeth doth come. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is it called to forest? What are these? So withered and so wild in their attire, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are on it. Speak, if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Gloms. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cador. All hail, Macbeth. Thou shalt be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start, and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? My noble partner you greet with present grace, and great prediction of noble having, and of royal hope, that he seems wrapped with all. To me you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time, and say which grain will grow, and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors, nor your hate. Hail. 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 Lesser than Macbeth, and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. By Sinnel's death I know I am Thane of Gloms, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives, a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief. No more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence. Speak, I charge you. Whither are they vanished? Into the air. Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane root that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. <laughs> and you shall be king. And Thane of Cawdor too, and did not so. To the self-same tune and words. Who's there? The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success. We are sent to give thee from our royal masters thanks. And, for an earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which addition, Hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Gloms and Thane of Cawdor? Do you not hope your children shall be kings when those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promise no less to them? Is strange, and oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, to betray us in deepest consequence. Cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success, commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor, if good. 
Why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? <laughs> Look how our partner's wrapped! If chance will have me king, why, chance may crown me without my stir. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Give me your favor. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Let us toward the king. Very gladly. Is execution done on Cador? My liege, he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and sent forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. Oh, worthiest cousin! The sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. More is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Noble Banquo! That hast no less deserved, nor must be known, no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee, and hold thee to my heart. There if I grow, the harvest is your own. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down, or else o'er leap. For in my way it lies. Stars hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. As the men celebrate their victory, the new Thane of Cawdor sends a letter to his wife. Lady Macbeth reads firsthand of her husband's victories, as well as the prophecies of the mystical newscasters. When I burned a question further, they vanished. Then came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me, along with Hail, King that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner, that thou mightst not be ignorant of what greatness is promised. Gloms thou art, and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Hie thee hither that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned with all. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. So please you, it is true, our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe-top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold, hold. Great gloms, worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he proposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Leave all the rest to me. This 
castle hath a pleasant seat. Heaven's breath smells wooingly here. I have observed the air is delicate. <laughs> see, see, our honoured hostess. All our service in every point twice done, then done double were poor in single business to contend against those honours deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. Give me your hand. Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly, and shall continue our graces towards him. As the lady of the house entertains their honoured guests, Macbeth ponders privately in his quarters. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, hoist upon the slightest couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. How now? What news? He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? Know you not he has? We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Pretty peace! I dare do all that become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was it, then, that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail. We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place, and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, his two chamberlains will I with wine and with sail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbic only. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lie as in death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? Bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber, and used their very daggers, that they have done it? Who dares receive it other, as we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death? Away, and mark the time with fairer show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. After dinner and lively celebration, Duncan and company break for a well-deserved night's sleep. How goes the night, boy? The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. Give me my sword. Who's there? A friend. What, sir? Not yet at rest? I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. I think not of them. Yet, when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business. If you would grant me the time. At your kindest leisure. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. 
Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight, or art thou but a dagger of the mind? A false creation, proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain. Nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls is watch. Thus, with his stealthy pace, with Tarkin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. While Macbeth commits his unforgivable act, his wife waits quietly in the nearby guest room. Alack, I am afraid they have awakened, and tis not done. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. My husband! I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Who lies in the second chamber? Donalbane. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight. There's one did laugh in sleep, and one cried murder, that they did wake each other. I stood and heard them, but they did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. One cried, God bless us, and amen the other, as they had seen me with these hangman's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen. When they did say, God bless us. Consider it not so deeply. Wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of a blessing, and amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Go get some water, and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again, I dare not. Infirm of purpose, give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but his pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with awe, for it must seem their guilt. Whence is that knocking? How is it with me when every noise appalls me? My hands are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. I hear a knocking at the south entry. Retire we to our chamber. A little water clears us of this deed. How easy it is, then. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there in the name of Beazelbub? Was it so late, friend, ere you went to bed that you do lie so late? Faith, sir, we were carousing till the second cock. The porter escorts Macduff and Lennox into Macbeth's parlor. Is thy master stirring? Our knocking has awaked him. Here he comes. Good morrow, noble sir. Good morrow, both. Is the king stirring, worthy Thane? Not yet. He did command me to call timely upon him. I have almost slipped the hour. I'll bring you to him. I'll make so bold to call, for tis my limited service. The night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down. And as they say, lamentings heard in the air. Strange screams of death clamored the live long night. 
Some say the earth was feverous and did shake. Twas a rough night. Oh, horror, horror, horror! Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee! What's the matter? Most sacrilegious murder! What is it you say? Mean you his majesty? Approach the chamber, and destroy your sight with a new gorgon! Do not bid me speak, see, and then speak yourselves! Awake! Awake! Ring the alarm bell, murder and treason! Had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time. From this instant there is nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys, renown and grace is dead. What is amiss? Your royal father's murdered. By whom? Those of his chamber, as it seemed, had done it. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood. So were their daggers. Oh, yet I do repent me of my fury that I did kill them. Wherefore did you so? Who can be wise, amazed, temperate, and furious, loyal and neutral in a moment? Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood, and his gash stabs looked like a breach in nature for ruin's wasteful entrance. There the murderers steeped in the colors of their trade, their daggers unmannerly breached with gore. Who could refrain that had a heart to love, and in that heart courage to make love known? Let us meet, and question this most bloody piece of work, to know it further. Fears and scruples shake us. In the great hand of God I stand, and thence, against the undivulged pretense, I fight of treasonous malice. And so do I. So, so all. Let's briefly put on manly readiness, and meet at the hall together. What will you do? I'll go to England. To Ireland, I, our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. Where we are, there are daggers in men's smiles. Is it known who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth hath slain. Alas, the day. What good could they pretend? They were suborned. Malcolm and Donaldbane, the king's two sons, are stolen away and fled which puts upon them suspicion of the deed. Against nature still, thriftless ambition, that will raven up thine own life's means. Then tis most like the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named, and gone to Scone to be invested. Will you to Scone? No, cousin, I'll to Fife. Well, I will thither. Well, may you see things well done there. Adieu, lest our old robe sit easier than our new. As predicted, Macbeth has become king. He now takes residence where Duncan once called home, the forest residence. Many expect him to be a great king, much like his predecessor. Thou hast it now. King, Cawdor, Gloms, all as the weird women promised. And I fear thou playedst most foully for it. Yet... It was said it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them, but hush, no more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast. Tonight we hold a solemn supper, sir. And I'll request your presence. Let your highness command upon me, to the which my duties are with a most indissoluble tie forever knit. Ride you this afternoon? Aye, my good lord. Is it far you ride? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt this and supper. Fill not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, goes Fleance with you? Aye, my good lord. I wish your horse is swift and sure of foot. Farewell. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me, and bade them speak to him. 
Then, prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown, and put a barren scepter in my gripe. Thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind, for them the gracious Duncan have I murdered, to make them kings the seat of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list, and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? Now go to the door. And stay there till we call. Have you considered my speeches? Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, my lord. So is he mine. And though I could with barefaced power sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall, who I myself struck down. And thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye, for sundry weighty reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command of us. Within this hour at most I will advise you where to plant yourselves. Acquaint you at the perfect spy of the time, the moment on it, for it must be done to-night, Fleon's his son, that keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of the dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight. If it find heaven, must find it out to-night. How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone, of sorriest fancies your companions making, using those thoughts which should have indeed died with them they think on? What's done is done. We have scotched the snake, not killed it. Gentle, my lord, sleek o'er your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I, love, and so, I pray, be you. Hark! I hear horses. Give us a light there! Ho! There tis he. The rest already are in the court. His horses go about. A light! A light! Tis he. Stand to it. It will be rain tonight. Let it come down. <laughs> oh, treachery! Fly, good fleance! Fly, fly, fly! Thou mayest revenge, O oh, slave! Who did strike out the light? Was not the way? There's but one down! The sun is fled. We have lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. A banquet has been prepared in Macbeth's honor. He has attended many like this, but never as the head of the table. Even then, Macbeth's celebrations must be interrupted by his deeds. Be large in mirth, anon we'll drink a measure the table round. There's blood on thy face. Tis Banquo's then. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. That I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats, yet he's good that did the like for Fleance. Most royal, sir. Fleance escaped. But Banquo's safe. Aye, my good lord. Safe in a ditch he bides. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. May it please your highness, sit. <laughs> the table's full. Here is a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. What is it that moves your highness? 
<laughs> Which of you have done this? What, my good lord? Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. Gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Sit, worthy friends. Pray you keep seat. The fit is momentary. Upon a thought, he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed and regard him not. Are you a man? Aye, and a bold one, that dare look on that which might appall the devil. Why do you make such faces? You look but on a stool. Prithee, see there. Behold, look, lo! If I stand here, I saw him. Fie for shame. The times have been, and when the brains were out, the man would die. And they are an end, but now they rise again, with twenty mortal murders on their crowns, and push us from our stools. My worthy lord, your noble friends do lack you. I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I'll sit down. Give me some wine. Fill full. I'll drink to the general joy of the whole table. Our duties and the pledge. <laughs> Avaunt! Quit my sight! Let the earth hide thee! Hence, horrible shadow! Unreal mockery, hence! Think of this, good peers, but as a thing of custom. Tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. You make me strange, even to the disposition that I owe, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks, when mine is blanched with fear. What sights, my lord? I am in blood stepped so far that, should I wait no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. Come, will to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use. We are yet but young indeed. In the newsroom, the witches are hard at work. Why, how now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason, beldams as you are, saucy and overbold? How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the close contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part. But... Make amends now. Get you gone, and at the pit of Acheron, meet me in the morning. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Hark, I am cold. My little spirit, see, sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. Hark, I am cold. My little spirit, see, sits in a foggy cloud and stays for me. I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell me where he bestows himself? The son of Duncan, from whom this tyrant holds the due of birth, lives in the English court. Thither Macduff is gone to pray the holy king upon his aid to wake Northumberland and warlike seaward that by the help of these with him above, to ratify the work, we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, and free from our feasts and banquets bloody knives. Do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now, and this report hath so exasperate the king that he prepares for some attempt of war. Sent he to Macduff? He did, and with an absolute sir, not I, the cloudy messenger, turns me his back. And that well might advise him to a caution to hold what distance his wisdom can provide. Filet of a fenny snake in the cauldron, boil and bake. Eye of Newton, toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. Oh, well done! 
I commend your pains, and every one shall share in the gains. And now, about the cauldron sing, alive elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that you put in. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? A deed without without a name. I conjure you, by that which you profess, however you come to know it, answer me. Speak. Demand. Will answer. Say if thou'dst rather hear it from our mouths, or from our masters. Call him. Let me see. Poor in sow's blood that had eaten her nine pharaoh. Grease that sweatin' from the murderer's gibbet, throw into the flame. Come high or low, thyself in office deftly show. Tell me, thou unknown power. He knows thy thought. Macbeth! 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 Beware Macduff, beware the fane of fight. Dismiss me, enough. Whate'er thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thou hast harped my fear aright, but one word more. Macbeth. 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 Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Be lion-meddled, proud, and take no care, who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be, until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. That will never be. Who can impress the forest, bid the tree unfix his earth-bound root? Sweet bodements, good! Yet tell me, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? I will be satisfied. Deny me this, and an eternal curse fall on you. Show. 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 Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows, so depart. Thou art too like the spirit of Banquo. Down! Thy crown does sear mine eyeballs, and thy hair, thou other gold-bound brow, is like the first. The third is like the former. Filthy hags! Why do you show me this? A fourth! Start eyes! What will the line stretch out of the crack of doom? Horrible sight! Now I see, tis true. For the blood boater Banquo smiles upon me, and points at them for his. What is this so? I, sir, all this is so. But why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? Are they gone? Come in, without there. I did hear the galloping of a horse. Who has it come by? Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word Macduff is fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. Time, thou anticipatest my dread exploits. The castle of Macduff I will surprise. Seize upon Fife. Give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. Let us observe now an in innocence. The Lady Macduff with her son, left alone, being kept from the news of her husband. What had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, madam. He had none. His flight was madness. When our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom? To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion and his titles in a place from when himself does fly? He loves us not. 
He wants a natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight her young ones in her nest against the owl. Cruel are the times. I take my leave of you. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. What is a traitor? Why, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so. Every one that does so is a traitor, and must be hanged. Who must hang them? Why, the honest men. Then the liars and swearers are fools, for there are liars and swearers and now to beat the honest men and hang up them. Now God help thee, poor monkey. What are these faces? Where is your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. He's a traitor. Thou liest, thou shag-haired villain! What? You egg? He has killed me, mother! Run away, I pray you! Murder! Murder! Unaware of what has happened, Macduff meets with Malcolm at the old election headquarters. Let us hold fast the mortal sword, and like good men bestride our downfall and birthdom. Each new morn new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face, that it resounds as if it felt with Scotland, and yelled out like syllable of dollar. This tyrant whose sole name blisters our tongues was once thought honest. You have loved him well. It's not touched you yet. I'm young, but something you may deserve of him through me, and wisdom to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry god. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. Fare thee well, lord. I would not be the villain that thou thinkest for the whole space that is in the tyrant's grasp. Be not offended. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. But for all this, when I shall tread upon the tyrant's head or wear it on my sword, yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before by him that shall succeed. What should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of vice so grafted that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow. <laughs> Not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned in evils to top Macbeth. I grant him bloody, but there's no bottom, none in my voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons, and your maids cannot fill up the cistern of my lust, and my desire all continent impediments would overbear that did oppose my will. Better Macbeth than such a one to reign. We have willing dames enough. There cannot be that vulture in you to devour so many as will to greatness dedicate themselves, finding it so inclined. With this there grows, in my most ill-composed affection, such a stanchless avarice that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels in this other's house, and my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. <sighs> this avarice sticks deeper, grows with more pernicious root than summer seeming lust. Oh, Scotland, Scotland! If such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I've spoken. Fit to govern? No, not to live! Fare thee well. These evils thou repeatest upon thyself have banished me from Scotland. Oh, my breast, thy hope ends here! <laughs> Megda. This noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples. For even now I put myself to thy direction, and unspeak mine own detraction. I'm yet unknown to woman, <laughs> never was forsworn, scarcely have coveted what was mine own. I had no time broke my faith, would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this, upon myself. <laughs> what I am truly is thine in my poor countries to command. Whither indeed, before thy here approach, old Seward, with ten thousand warlike men, already at a point, was setting forth. Now we'll together, and our chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. Why are you silent? Such welcome and unwelcome things at once. 
"'Tis hard to reconcile. See, who comes here? Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave, where good men's lives expire before the flowers in their caps. Be it their comfort we are coming thither. Gracious England hath lent us good steward and ten thousand men, an older and a better soldier none that Christendom gives out. What I could answer this comfort with the like, but I have words that would be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not latch them. What concern they? No mind that's honest but in it shares some woe, though the main part pertains to you alone. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Your castle is surprised, your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. My children too? Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. Be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. All my pretty ones? Did you say all? Dispute it like a man. I shall do so. Gentle heavens, cut short all intermission. Front to front bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length set him! This tune goes, manly. Come, go we to the king. Our power is ready. We return once more to the forest residence, on the brink of a new conflict. Macbeth's worries are on the approaching armies, ignoring all else. Out, damned spot, out, I say. One, two, why then tis time to it? Hell is murky, fie, my lord, fie, a soldier in a feared. What need we fear, who knows it, when none can call our power to account? Yet, yet who would have thought the old man to have so much blood in him? The thane of Fife had a wife, where is she now? What, will these hands never be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that. You mar all this with starting. Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand, oh. Oh, oh, wash your hands, put on your nightgown, look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Bank was buried, he cannot come out on's grave. To bed, to bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. Bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. Give me my armor. Tis not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses. Scur the country round. Hang those that talk of fear. Give me mine armor. I will not be afraid of death in vain, till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. Seward and Macduff begin their approach on Dunsinane. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. Let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery air and report of us. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here let them lie till famine and the ague eat them up. <laughs> what is that noise? It is the cry of women, my good lord. The time has been, my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell of hair would at a dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full of horrors, direness familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. 
creeps in this petty pace. From day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. I begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not, till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane, and now a wood comes toward Dunsinane. Arm, arm and out. Ring the alarm bell. Blow in, come rack. At least we'll die with harness on our back. They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear-like I must fight the course. Turn, hellhound! Turn! <laughs> thou losest labor. As easy mayst thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword and presses make me bleed. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm, and let the angel whom thou hast served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped! Accursed be the tongue that tells me so. I'll not fight thee! Then yield thee! I will not yield, to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet, and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou posed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Lay on, Macduff, and damn be him that first cries, Hold! Enough! Ah! Ah! It does not take long for Macduff's forces to overtake the residents. The battle has ended. I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. Some must go off, and yet by these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. Macduff is missing, and your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. Then he is dead? Aye, and brought off the field. Why then, God's soldier be he. Had I as many sons as I have hairs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. Hail, King, for so thou art. Behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head, the time is free. Hail, King of Scotland. Hail, King of Scotland. My thanes and kinsmen? Henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who, as tis thought, by self and violent hands took off her life. This, and what needful else that calls upon us by the grace of grace we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once, and to each one, who we invite to see us crowned at Scone.
President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassins' bullets in downtown Dallas. But you can't ever accept when they steal and raid, can't accept. Go astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. The wall that the East Germans put up in 1961 to keep its people in. Will now... Thank you for listening to the Blank Conversations Theater Company's presentation of The Tragedy of Macbeth by William Shakespeare, edited by J.P. Crabb. The cast includes Nick Mayhew as Macbeth, Gina DiMondo as Lady Macbeth, Lauren Jackson as Banquo, Kendall Hicks as Macduff, Ed Montez as Duncan and Hecate, David Bruner as Ross, Satan, and Macbeth's Messenger, Aaron Windorf as Lennox, Sergeant, and Seward. Max Klein as Fleance, Donald Bane, Lord, Macduff's son, and Angus. Emily James as First Witch, First Murderer, and Porter. Mara Carmona as Second Witch, Second Murderer, and Lady Macduff and Cassandra Galpon as Third Witch, Third Murderer, Malcolm, Lady Macbeth's Messenger, and Attendant. The Tragedy of Macbeth was directed by Jose Luis Solorzano and edited by Gus David Sanchez. If you enjoyed this production, please consider donating to the continuation of programs such as these to Blank Conversations Theatre Company. You can check them out at www.blankconversations.org or check them out on social media. If you're interested in participating in radio programming with Blank Conversations, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for making art happen. Thank you.